بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه We are ayah 46 surah al-ankabut the spider which is surah number 29 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تجادلوا أهل الكتاب إلا بالتي هي أحسن إلا الذين ظلموا منهم وقولوا آمنا بالذي أنزل إلينا وأنزل إليكم وإلهنا وإلهكم واحد ونحن له مسلمون كذلك أنزلنا إليك الكتاب فالذين آتيناهم الكتاب يؤمنون به ومن هؤلاء من يؤمن به وما يشهد بآياتنا إلا الكافرون In the previous ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to follow and recite what is revealed to him and to establish prayer and this is his now Uh, model of uh, religious duties and uh, being close to Allah and seeking guidance from Allah in all matters of life. So when you are going to be discussing theology and religion, then you must have a mode of worship and a mode and a paradigm of intellectual and academic uh, thought. So the Qur'an is that uh, paradigm, if you want to call it that, in a very loose way, for intellectual academic discussions. And Salat is your mode of worship that you're going to benefit from Allah's presence through that mode and method of organized ritual worship. That's the back, backdrop to the following ayah, which is this ayah. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, do not argue with the Ahli Kitab, with the people of the book, except with that which is better. بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Except that those who are wrongdoers amongst them and those who are unjust amongst them to themselves or to others and then those who say we believe in whatever is revealed to us and whatever is revealed to you and our Lord and your Lord our God and your God is the one and only the same being and it is to him alone that we submit so this is our code okay civilizational code to the ahli kitab so obviously nowadays we are dealing with ahli kitab all over namely the jews and christians with all their various different disparate denominations they all ahli kitab they all believe something about Isa alayhi salam and something about Musa alayhi salam. So that uh, terminology, nomenclature, has not changed from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, nor should we seek to change it, leave it the way the Qur'an has intended to be, by saying they, they no longer follow Christianity or Judaism, it doesn't matter, any more than Muslims follow Islam. Uh, So the nomenclature and the terminology doesn't change because of people's actions and what, what they believe and what they hold to be the divine truth. Okay. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is now saying, as part of your test to be a believer and a Muslim, you must prepare yourself to discuss theism, theology, religion with others. Hmm. You know, the beginning of the ayah, uh, Surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif la mim, ahasib al-nas, ayyudrafu wa yakhulu, aminna wa hum la iftalun. That do you think for a moment that you will not be tested because you say you believe? 
So as part of your test and trial as a believer, you will be fest, uh, you faced with uh, social and political trials with other people. Now, you have to stand up to those tests, you have to measure up to those trials, and you have to pass them. That is a methodology, it's an approach. You cannot shy away from it and say, I will never discuss any religion with anybody. It's about me and my salvation, and I should mind other people's business. Well, that's not part of the test. <laughs> uh, come up and bat for yourself. Come to the plate, get your own bat, and you do your job, basically. Based the, the approach is in your, your willingness to actually prepare for the discussion. Yeah. You must prepare yourself for the discussion. We are not saying that we go to everybody's homes, knock on the door and say, I want to debate with you. But when the opportunity does arise, you're going to have to be prepared. Yeah. That on these occasions, when the platform is there, set, where? Everywhere. With your neighbor, with your colleagues at school, with your co-workers, with your employers, with your employees, with your congressman, with your state representative, uh, with the media. God forbid anyone's there. But, anyway. but you're going to have to do that if that situation comes in front of you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now expressing this reality of social life. What's the reality of this country? People know you're Muslim. And people will ask you, why do you say this? Why do you say this? How come you're always this way and that way? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a methodology with which we can approach the Ahli Kitab, namely the Jews and the Christian. They are in one, they're, they're, they're in one bracket. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brackets them in one. So he says, Wala tujadil. Don't argue and dispute. The Ahl Kitab, meaning that argumentation is not always the best way from the get-go. Yeah, you don't want to be argumentative uh, as a policy. Yeah. Don't argue. Yeah. However, if there is an occasion for you to argue, then do so illa billatihi ahsan with that way and method which is the best. Yeah. And what's the best? That depends on where you are and who you are talking to. Okay. It will change from place to place, city to city, country to country, denomination to denomination. Okay. So if you are going to discuss with a Lutheran, it's going to be very different from the way you discuss with a Seventh-day Adventist and from a Jehovah's Witness and from other people that they will have different nuances. Okay, And you may need to be conversant with those nuances if you go in onto a platform of debate and argumentation. Don't go unprepared. And it's going to be different than, than when you are debating with a Jew. Debating with a Reformed Jew and an Orthodox Jew. Right. The two modes will be nuanced. So we have to be prepared for that. And that preparation is your test. The test is not actually the actual debate. The test is the preparation before it. For that, you need to spend time, money, effort, and form committees and communities and uh, work groups, working groups and workshops, and do all of the hard work which we're not willing to do, uh, read, and then ask, and then learn. What we do is that uh, there's a function at, uh, on Lakeshore, where they're inviting Muslims and Christians, and all Muslims go, mashallah, very well dressed, uh, but undress themselves <coughs> when they talk. Uh, they're very well dressed, they're smart, smile, mashallah, impeccable. And when they talk, they talk nonsense and rubbish. Why? Right? Because they neither know Islam nor do they know the religion they're talking about. <laughs> That's not your test. Your test is the preparation. The Prophet ﷺ prepared the Sahaba for such occasions. 
in the seer of the Prophet ﷺ during the Amr al-Fud, the year of dedications and, uh, you know, people who came to visit the Prophet ﷺ from every quarter of the Hijaz of the peninsula. One tribe came with their representatives and they were known for their skills in presentation, their oratory skills. So the Prophet ﷺ knew that this tribe is coming, so he prepared the Sahaba for this occasion. This is in the Seerah. So when they came, uh, they said that um, the tribe chief said, bring us your best orators, your best public speakers. He said, okay. So the Prophet ﷺ said to one Sahaba, you stand up. So now, as the guest, they were told to speak first, and the Sahabi responded, mesmerized by his ability to speak. Then they said, give us your best debaters. So he told another Sahabi, you stand up. And the same thing happened. Then they said, give us your best poets. The Prophet said to that Sahabi, you stand up. So they left, and they said, that your debaters are far more superior than ours, okay? and your lecturers uh, are far more better than ours, and your poets are far more better than ours. This is in the seer of the Prophet It was an attorney, he had an ad hoc committee, you know, this is going to do this. <laughs> it was very methodic. يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ الْحِكْمَةِ He teaches you the kitab and hikmah. He teaches you the kitab and hikmah. The Prophet ﷺ on a regular basis trained the Sahaba how to think, how to talk, how to debate. He didn't teach them poetry, but they were gifted in that. But they had this skill set also, but then I'm sure they exemplified their abilities through that school also. So here this ayah is saying to Muslims, that don't debate. Meaning it should not be the purpose of your life to debate with the Jews and Christians. But if an occasion does arise, be prepared for it. <laughs> yes. So it's a, it's a contingency <coughs> plan. In case this happens, you must do this. So now in every building you have a contingency plan. Okay? You have a drill for fire, for tornadoes and so on. So likewise, in Islamic academia, there are contingency plans. Of it. If you're going to be faced with the atheists, then you must do this. If you're going to be faced with Jews and Christians, with this, and with uh, communism, this. And with, uh, so there has to be education at that level. Yeah. And at that level, it must be better than what they have. بِالَّتِيهِ ahsan, Which is better. Okay. So now you have to come to terms with creating a model of scholarship that is going to dictate the tempo in debate with the Ahli Kitab. And Ahli Kitab obviously doesn't mean not just in theology or theism, which is what is immediately implied. It could be their way of life, their culture, their civilization, whatever. So this eye is loaded with a civilizational development. That you want to develop your civilization, do this. And this is what the MashaAllah, the Ottomans did to their credit in, in their heyday that they developed scholars who were able to do all of this at a very official level. They had scholars who, uh, one of their prerequisites was they must know Latin so that they can go and debate with the Pope and the Vatican. <laughs> right? This is in their memoirs, you see. So what I'm saying is that we had this made this approach to Islam as a civilizational code and a civilizational value. Now we don't have that value because everybody is saying that as long as I get to do what I want to do in the masjid, then Islam is okay. And if I don't get to do what I want to do in the masjid, Islam is no, no good. So it's not about you, it's about where you are. In this, in this country, you must realize where you are. And where you are requires ten years of good study, ten years of uh, thinking, ten years of planning before you say, I'm going to do this, because that's what they do. 
Right? You think they debate with Muslims because only, only because they're, 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 they're idiots. And so when the Republicans say they don't want Sharia law, it's very well thought out. It's not a slogan. They actually know what it means. Okay? And they have advisors and they've studied it. And they know exactly where this will lead to if they allow any state to have Islamic law. Okay? Now, do we have that level of sophistication, dedication, and scholarship? No. Uh, again, anti-Muslim slogan. No, anti-Muslim. Okay? Understand what it is they're saying, then have a response. That response has to be academic and intelligent. It cannot be community-wise, nor should it be emotional. So, billatihi ahsan means you have to do the work. That which is better, ahsan, from the word ahsan, you, you develop the excellence in the way you are going to uh, put forward your Islam. <coughs> right? When you have that level of sophistication and dedication, then it's fine. The, the um, lecture, that uh, the speech, Jafar, the Allah uh, gave, in front of Najashi, do you think that was rehearsed and prepared, or do you think it was just extempore? Was he an official representative of the Prophet ﷺ when he went there to Abyssinia, or was he just, uh, I'll wing it? No. It was prepared. He was indoctrinated. He was trained by the Prophet ﷺ. And then through that training, he was able to deliver the lecture and the speech he delivered. The words might have been extempore, but the training was very rigorous. There were a number of years that they were able to actually identify with those values, and present them in front of a world leader, in front of a king. So the one say that it is, it is a mythical to believe that the Sahaba, as soon as they saw the Prophet Wasallam, they were great ulama. It doesn't happen in the real world. What happened was that they trained. He teaches them. He teaches. Teaching means there's instruction, there's a methodology, there's an approach, there's time, there's a dedication, as you see in the quotes of the Sahaba when they were learning from the Prophet in Medina. They were not ad hoc conferences or seminars or conventions where people come and they gather and they listen to one wonderful lecture and now the problems of the Ummah are solved. It's never happened that way. And it is mythical and stupid for us as people who live in the States to actually think that way that this is going to happen. It doesn't happen in your field. <laughs> Whichever field you want to represent, you, know, you take years and decades to develop that level of expertise. So what I'm saying is that the, we need institutions that can do this for us. And that is what is meant here. The Prophet ﷺ was more than an institution, he was more than a university, he was a Nabi. So he trained the Sahaba with so many skills that it came to them when they were called upon to uh, you know, take the test. So this is a test. Uh, Islam, when it went to other countries, did not spread overnight. Uh, there were many decades before uh, people in those countries became Muslim uh, altogether. Thirty years, forty years, fifty years, some countries, a uh, hundred years and more. Likewise, we still have time in this country to move away from the unnecessary uh, politics of the Muslim Ummah and focus on this eye and develop schools and institutions where you're going to train people to think this way and uh, make themselves ready for the test if indeed the test ever comes, which hopefully it will not. You don't want to be tested unnecessarily. You do not want to debate with people unnecessarily. But when the time comes, you should be ready. That's the basic point of this ayah, this now. The Prophet is, uh, this was the last uh, surah to be revealed in Makkah. This surah. Ankabur. After this surah came Medina. Now, he was not going to debate with the Ahl Kitab where? In Mecca. Where was he going to debate? In Medina. So Allah is now training the Prophet ﷺ and uh, he, he, he preparing his psyche and his intelligence so that he understands that where he is going, there's going to be another test. In Mecca, there was a test of the Mushrik. 
in Medina there's going to be tests of Gita and Kitab. So be prepared for that also. And this is how you will seek guidance from Salat and from Wahi. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Except those who are totally unjust and ruthless amongst them, meaning that sometimes you want to say no to debate when you know the opponent is going to be stubborn. Uh, he's not going to concede them. So now the purpose of debate is to ex- expose the truth okay, and make sure that the opponent or the person in front of you knows that this is the truth. If the person in front of you is already a stubborn person and very unjust and uh, tyrannical in its approach to life and society and uh, the community, then you may want to shy away from that. In our history, we have a precedence in this approach to understanding Islam and presenting Islam in front of non-Muslims. The Muslims of Spain did it very early on. And then the Muslims of India, okay, post-mutiny, they did it. So after the mutiny, when the British now came over and they started to dominate northern India and then eventually other parts of India, the ulama of Dilban saw that the only way forward was not to fight the British on political terms nor on military terms, but to fight them on academic terms. And that was the seed for the conception of Darun Dilband. Mawlana Qasim Nanutri, Ali, the founder of Darun Dilband, was a great munadhir. Okay. He was a, a manifestation of this ayah. Yeah. That whenever he was called upon to debate with the Christian missionaries and the agents of the British, he stood like a pillar and said, bring it on. And that's what he did. And he debated. And he won every debate. To the point where when people found out yeah. that Mawlana al-Qasim is coming to the debate, they would cancel the debate. They would concede before it happened. Right? And then he debated with the Hindus, and he debated with people who wanted to change and distort Islam. So he was a great munadhir. And that is why the ulama of Dilban called him Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. Just as Imam Ghazali was called Hujjat al-Islam, the proof of Islam. But he prepared himself and he prepared his students. His most outstanding student is Shaykh al-Hind, Maulana Mahmoud Hassan, rahimullah. And he was also a great debater. So they were prepared. Meaning these questions are going to arise and we need to prepare ourselves. So in the curriculum of Darul Dilman, at the end, he was specialized in debate. Ilmul Munadhara is a fun, is a science in the Deobindi curriculum, okay, which they used to teach. They don't teach anymore because they're debating themselves. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, this was the intention of Mawlana Qasim, that academically and intellectually we must show that what we believe in is not just coherent and sound, it is far more superior than anything you have to offer to mankind. And that is what he did. And now this is how you develop institutions. Likewise, here we have an opportunity in this country where you still have freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and you have freedom of debate, as you can see with Mr. Trump uh, going around the country proving that point. Right? So now we must do the same. I mean, at least the preparation must be there. We do not want to go on CNN or in front of Congress unnecessarily but God forbid something happens and somebody has to go there, then somebody must be representing. Somebody is that institution, not a person. Islam is never represented simply by one personality. It is represented by an institution. That is how we get the theory of being a collective mujaddid. Mawlana Qasim's grandson, Qari Tayyar, who was my mentor, he used to say that the theory of tajdeed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises a mujaddid at the beginning of every century is a collective mujaddid, not an individual mujaddid. Okay? Because in order for you to justify that one person is an individual mujaddid, it's very difficult historically. But you may justify an institution or a movement to be a mujaddid movement or mujaddid institution. So he was calling the ulama to do this in a very subtle way that you collectively as ulama 
you must do this, you must do the tajdeed and the revival of deen as an institution and forget about your name and fame and glory and becoming a worldwide celebrity. That's not going to happen. Right? Worldwide celebrities have accepted Islam. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali. Has that changed the world? No. So going after celebrities is like what Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Abbas, Abbas Awatawalla. That theory is never going to work. It has never worked. It never worked for the Quraysh. It never worked in the seer of the Prophet ﷺ. It has to be a community. It has to be an ummah. That ummah has to be the ummah of people of ilm. Because this is juxtaposed with the people of the book. What does Ahl Kitab mean? It means the people of the book, the scripture, people who know how to read and write the theology and theism in their tradition of theology and theism. So you must develop something that is better than that. And that is an ummah who are not Ahlul Kitab, but they are Ahlul Quran, Ahlul Wahi. Who are those who know Wahi? The people who study the Quran and Sunnah. The people who study the fiqh of the Ummah. They are the Ahlul Quran. And this is how we need to move forward with this ayah and become a manifestation of this, although it may take quite a few years. <laughs> but without patience, you won't do anything. Okay? We want a quick fix, unfortunately. Okay? Our understanding of Islam is, Islam is now Las Vegas style drive through marriage. It doesn't work that way. It never has and it never will. You need time, because when you want to grow a tree, even today in the, in the world of computers, where it's a push button and you get an answer, have you developed a tree that is push button? I hope not. <laughs> It'd be outrageous. Have you developed a human being that's push button? Okay. Has, has your genetics taken you to a level where, let's go into the mother's womb, never mind the ten months of pain, Just push a button and you get a baby. And never mind the uh, 15 years of turmoil and struggle of raising a child at home. Uh, push a button and you get a child who is 15 years old or 18 years old. I don't know. You're not developing matter. You're developing human beings. That's over time. 20 years, 25 years, 30. whatever it is. Go through the process. You are not exempt from that process. Muslims, for some reason, have come to terms with the idea that this is the computer, computer age and we are exempt from the process of human norms. No, that doesn't happen. And it will never happen. So we must be ready for this test. And this test is upon us now as we speak. And it's Allah's fadl that we have people in the world today who are able uh, to help us, uh, inshallah, prepare for this test. And then your civilizational statement should be وَقُولُوا and say and declare. This is what you declare as your premise for debate. آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا That we believe in revelation. Whatever is revealed to us, we believe in. وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ And whatever is revealed to you, we believe in. So our theory is consistent. It doesn't matter to us whether Musa received the wahi, or Isa received the wahi, or Muhammad received the wahi, wahi is wahi, we believe in all of it. What's your problem? Your problem is that you don't believe in the wahi that Isa received, or your problem is that you don't believe in the wahi that Muhammad received, because if you believed in wahi, you believe in all of it. That's your problem. Okay. To this there is no response. And anyone who claims wahi after Muhammad sallallahu is an imposter. He's a Dajjal. So wahi terminates with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There's no wahi after him. And wahi came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So now who's accommodating wahi the most? The Muslims. The Muslims say we believe in that wahi, this wahi, and our wahi. Whereas you don't. You make shirk in your wahi. You, you, you have a selected, uh, a selected process by which you say we accept this wahi and not that wahi. 
So if you want to talk about revelation, being what God wants, which is revelation, then we are the most universal, we are the most accommodating, uh, we do not divide, uh, commit shirk in, accepting wahi, whereas you do. This is our statement as a religious civilization. Wukuru, make this statement. Amanna billadi unzil ilayna wa unzil ilaykum. And then, wa ilahuna wa ilahum wahid. Why do we believe in the wahi that came to Musa and Isa? Because your God and our God is the same. He's one. See, if Allah reveals to Musa, we believe. Allah reveals to Isa, we believe. Allah reveals Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we believe in it. Why? Because it's He who is now revealing. It's not about us. It's about what Allah has done and does do. And because we believe in this, وَنَحْنَ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ It is to Him alone that we submit. We submit only to Allah. We're not submitting to human civilizations. So we're not submitting to the community of Musa, nor are we submitting to the community of Isa, nor are we submitting to the community of Muhammad We are submitting to the same God who reveals everybody. That's the process by which we internalize this first, and then we speak it. And when you speak it, there's no response to this. What response can you have to this? No response to so this is the way you set your premise for debate before you get into any kind of discussion. We understand what it is you believe in first. If you don't understand what you believe in, then you will not be able to represent what you believe in, uh, even though they will understand what you believe in, and that's why they're willing to debate. You only debate when you know that the opponent is weak. As in the case of Mawlana Qasim, when they knew the opponent was strong, they scampered. They wouldn't stand in front of him ever. Right? So when you know the opponent is weak, that's when you debate it. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the trump card. And you say, look, this is not about uh, killing people. It's not about violence. It's, not, it's about intellectual and academic honesty, integrity. That intellectually, if you say you believe in God, then do you, do you believe in everything that God revealed? If you say yes, then believe in us. I mean, in the Quran. And if you say no, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> then you've been biased and you've been prejudiced. Right? So this is the way that you want to internalize what it is you want to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Train the Prophet sallallahu this way so that he would be ready for the Ahl Kitab in Medina. Right? وَكَذَلِكَ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُ الْكِتَابِ Thus, we have revealed to you the revelation, the book. So now this word of kitab here means revelation. And in Ahli Kitab, the word kitab means whatever was revealed to them, but that which they wrote also. Right? So this kitab is unwritten because the Prophet ﷺ did not read or write. And the kitab in Ahli Kitab is the written whatever they documented, although some of it was distorted and corrupted. So Allah says, this is how we reveal to you the book, the unwritten book, the spoken book of Kitab. So those whom we gave the book, they believed in it, meaning they still believe in the Quran, Wahi, because they believe in Wahi, period, whatever comes from Allah. وَمِنْ هَأُولَاءِ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهِ And from these, meaning from the Ahl Kitab, there are those who believe in it also, meaning people from the Ahl Kitab will believe in the Qur'an, and thus they will become Muslim, and they will accept Islam and Muhammad wasallam. So this is a bashara and a prediction uh, by the Prophet wasallam to, uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet wasallam that when you go about doing what you're supposed to do the way Allah wants you to, there will be people who will start to believe in you. Meaning this is the way forward. Meaning this is the way they're going to come in. This methodology will bring people closer to you and bring them into your deen and into your fold. This is uh, academic and intellectual integrity and honesty. This is based on amana and trust. That This is a trust from God. I have to deliver the trust the way he wants me to without compromising anything.
وما يجحد بآياتنا إلا الكافرون. And then only those who are disbelievers will deny and uh, fight against our proofs and our signs and our ayat, our revelations. Jahad, juhud, is not just disbelieving; it is now fighting and debating with the intent of disbelieving. So now you are actually you are, you are a rebel or within to begin with. And then, based on that rebellion, you will disbelieve in what is the truth. So here, that is why debating becomes a very messy enterprise. <laughs> so, as human beings, we do become uh, biased, and we do become prejudiced, and we do become uh, very deliberate, not deliberate, but passionate and emotional about what we believe in, which should be the case. Okay? So it's very difficult to maintain your integrity when your deen is being attacked. So you have to train for that also. So what is the training? The training is that those who disbelieve, they're not disbelieving in what you are saying, they're disbelieving in God. And then oh, let Allah do and decide what He wants to do and decide for them, with them, against them. That's not your prerogative. You deliver the message. This is the message. Plain and simple. So you maintain your emotion and you maintain your passion, and you maintain your sophistication and your dignity, and you show people that this is the way prophets behave when they are debating. Because, okay? you know, all prophets debated. Nuh from Nuh onwards, every prophet uh, debated with his people, uh, with Nuh uh, Ibrahim being uh, the par excellence uh, debater. So he debated with <coughs> the words in Namrud. So what I'm saying is that debating for the sake of the truth is a necessary component in Islamic intellectual uh, uh, legacy for us to appreciate. If we lose sight of that and say we should not debate, then we are not uh, fulfilling our obligation towards Allah. Now every Muslim doesn't need to know this skill. <laughs> and every Muslim definitely should not be debating about anything. Yeah. How do we do this? The way I suggested, and that is through institutions. That you must be able to produce students of knowledge and scholars who are able to produce others who may have one uh, skill in debate. Yeah. And that's how it's always been done in history. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken work from individuals and institutions in our history where they have come to the defense of Islam, academically and intellectually. Where Ibrahim al-Islam is one man, one human being, he is also a Nabi of Allah, and he is debating with the world ruler of that time. Namrud was a world ruler. And he was in the height of their civilization was seen as being a representation of Namrud's authority over people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared Ibrahim al-Islam to debate with Namrud. He didn't go with a gun. He didn't go with missiles. He didn't go with a bomb. He didn't go with anything except his belief in Allah being one. He went with his Nabuwa, with whatever knowledge and nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. And he was able to now defeat the person who disbelieved. فَبُهِذَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ so the one who disbelieved was now rendered uh, dumbfounded. He could not speak. And that is the purpose of debate. The purpose of debate is not physical confrontation. Okay? The purpose of debate is intellectual confrontation where there is nothing left for the person in front of you to do except either concede or become more stubborn. You read all the conversations and debates Musa a.s. had with whom? Firaun. <laughs> They're mind-boggling, as we saw in Surah Al-Qasas. Mind-boggling conversations in Surah Al-Shu'ara and other places. Meaning that the way Musa a.s. articulated his position in front of someone who was a world leader, the leader of the greatest civilization on earth at that time, was incredible. The Muslims must learn from this that representation has to come from the previous ayah. Follow wahi and then salat. 
So Wahi gives you your intellectual or academic superiority, and Salat gives you your spiritual superiority, where you need to be refined, reformed internally also. This was the method of the Sahaba. The Sahaba were trained by the Prophet ﷺ, so whenever they would engage in a conversation or potentially a debate with people, the answers were there, and they would articulate the way that they were trained. This is Allah's fadl on the Sahaba, and then they came down into the Ta'im. Imam Abu Hanifa, Allah was also a great debater. Okay, before he studied the fiqh, meaning fiqh at that level at that time, was a different standard, but before he came into studying Islamic law for the sake of assisting uh, Muslim governments, uh, he was a debater. Right? He debated with every known and now a uh, sect uh, that was misguided. The Qadariyas, the Jabariyas, the atheists, the Mu'tazili, whoever. And he would go out of his way, spend his own money to go to different towns and different cities and debate with those people. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everybody uh, this ability to understand their deen. But he chooses whom he wants to choose for this kind of work, which is the highest level of number. What is the highest rank of Nabuwa? Your debate with others who do not believe in God or who believe in God the wrong way. That is the greatest ibadah of any Nabi. Okay? This came down into the Ummah with few institutions and a few individuals and that was why we are saying the same thing today that we need to focus on this so that we prepare ourselves just in case there is a test. Allah save us from any such test and keep us under his comfort and afia. The better way for us socially is that people don't argue. And we don't need to initiate the argument. But if there is, then we need a contingency plan. Just in case, God forbid, as I mentioned, we don't need any fire anywhere in any building. But God forbid there is then, we need to know how to handle it. There has to be a contingency plan. So you need fire drills and you hurricanes or God forbid tornadoes or other things that happen in nature. Alright? So we'll stop here today and we'll continue with this next week when we meet.